Hello and welcome everyone to our professional education development offering today. Um, the National Council of University Research Administrators Region 7 Professional Education Development Committee is pleased to welcome you to today's presentation on ergonomic principles and practice at the home. Um, at the office or home environment. The purpose of PEDC is to support professional development activities for regional members and provide a broad range of educational services to ensure that all regional members have access to professional development programming my name is Tricia Sothergill, and it's my pleasure to serve you today. I am the chair of Region 7, and I'm also a committee member on the PEDC, as well as your facilitator for today's webinar. A couple housekeeping items. Please note that today's presentation is being recorded. Uh, the presentation will last probably around 60 minutes. Um, whether you're using audio from your computer or phone, please be sure your line is muted during the presentation. Um, if you have a question or comment, please utilize the chat feature or raise your hand. I'll be monitoring both throughout uh, today's presentation. Also, I will be putting in a survey link into the chat. Please take the survey uh, if you're able um, for us as well. So that being said, it's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, who is Dr. Dave Gilkey. He's an associate professor at Montana Tech in the Department of Safety, Health, and Industrial Hygiene. He has nearly 40 years experience in occupational and environmental health with expertise in ergonomics, safety, and workplace wellness. Dr. Gilkey earned his doctorate of chiropractic degree from Southern California Health Sciences University and a PhD from Colorado State University with a focus in occupational health, safety, industrial hygiene, and ergonomics. He is a certified professional ergonomist, a certified safety professional, and a registered environmental health and health safety. Ugh, good gracious. You have so many certifications, I can't get them out. Registered environmental health specialist. Dr. Guilty has authored and our co-authored 30 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, 66 articles in trade journals, and provided three book chapter contributions in the areas of ergonomics, occupational safety, and environmental health. He's taught both undergrad and graduate level courses in environmental and public health, occupational health, and ergonomics. Prior to coming to Montana Tech, Dr. Guilty was a professor at Colorado State for 20 years. Before his career in higher education, he was a practicing doctor of chiropractic for 15 years in San Jose, California. Dr. Gilkey specialized in occupational health and orthopedic conditions. So very well experienced. We are very lucky to have him uh, presenting and sharing his information today. At this point, I will turn the program over to Dr. Gilkey to get us started. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, Tricia. Boy, that was quite an introduction. Well, build up here. I, I'm hearing is that feedback from somewhere, I guess. Well, all right. As long as it's right, I'll just keep going. But I was going to say that, uh, and a little bit of that background, thank you for including that, because as a doctor of chiropractic, that I treated musculoskeletal injuries, and many of them were, uh, most of them were work-related, actually. So uh, after 15 years of that, I decided I'd move to the prevention side. And uh, to that end, it's been a fabulous career ever since. So I consider myself a, a, a health educator for the past 40 years. And I love ergonomics because it's really about structure and function. And, and if I can prevent those many types of uh, injuries and illnesses that I treated, then I consider that a huge success. So uh, what I want to say is that hopefully some takeaways from today's session would include you would have a, uh, some basic knowledge about what ergonomics is built upon and, and then uh, ultimately with some of the practices that you could apply. So we'll talk about ergonomic risk factors and hopefully you'll be able to identify those in your own workspace or, or uh, at your workplace, wherever you go. And uh, you should be able to walk away with some skills to evaluate your workspace and work interface as well as others, and then make some uh, recommendations to improve that. So again, uh, along that house cleaning side of stuff. Uh, so I sent a, 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 a short list, I would call it, of items that if you are interested, Trish has them. And then she would be happy to share those with you. She can send them out. So what, uh, if you want to be more systematic, you can use an evaluation form. So I've got a couple of newer ones that I've uh, devised that are posture based. They're quick and easy. They don't take a lot of training. Actually, following today's session, you should be able to use them. And if you want to be a little more complete, there's one called a great uh, number four here, which stands for Gilkey Rapid Ergonomic Assessment Tool. 
So there are many ergonomic assessment tools that I created that one some years ago and, and use it when I have to be more comprehensive. The chair is very important. So there's actually a chair evaluation process that you can uh, have follow the form and complete that. Uh, NIOSH is the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And they have a symptom survey that they recommend be administered when you do a workstation evaluation to find out if somebody's having some problems of any sort. A chair primer is just uh, is a paper that I wrote up about the chair because actually the chair is, is the most important uh, piece of office equipment that we that we uh, use. It's certainly the most frequently one that we use, but it's really, really important relative to our comfort and our productivity and quality and all the things that we do. So I'll talk more about that, but there's some information that you could read about that and visual ergonomics. Since you are an industry that is, is looking, you're knowledge workers and you're looking at a, a computer screen all day, there are some drawbacks to that. So it just so happens that the most common complaint is eye fatigue. And I think the new LED screens have actually helped that somewhat. But uh, visual ergonomics is, is, is a whole subset in the area of ergonomics. And if you'd like to learn a bit more, go ahead and read us just a couple of pages on that. And then desk stretches. So uh, another thing that has happened is that uh, more people, more than ever, are at workstations and they're less active. So my workstation actually is a sit-stand combination. So I'm sitting right now on a stool and I can raise it and stand. And really that kind of combination of physical activity is really good. But if you are stuck at a sitting station, taking a break and doing some stretches is a good thing. So they have got that pulled out of uh, Anderson's book, who's kind of the stretch guru. So if you're interested in any additional educational materials, uh, then uh, Trish has those and can send them to you. Uh, what I would also like to invite, and maybe Trish, you could help, is if you, if anybody thinks of a question that's really right, right now uh, relative to what's on, shoot that to uh, Trish and then she can ask that uh, uh, to the whole group and then I'll, I'll answer that. So I think that'd be nice as well as some questions at the end. Yep, if you have a question, just pop it in the chat and I will get it asked. Perfect, thank you, Trish. So first of all, for all of you that uh, think you know what ergonomics is, uh, and you, many of you may, uh, and you, you do, you have at least have some sort of understanding because it's been in the news for a number of years. And, and I like to say that, that it's really, um, you know, it's ergonomics, it's about three things that come together, right? It's about a person doing a job in some place with some set of tools. And so uh, how we put that together, that interface really greatly impacts some other business priorities, things like productivity, efficiency, quality, of uh, uh, competition, as well as safety and health. So ergonomics is not just about injury prevention, if you will, it's really more about optimization of the human interface. And, and, and if you optimize that interface, then you get better efficiency, you get better productivity, you get better quality, and you're more competitive in this crazy world of competition. So, uh, so ergonomics really is very, very broad. And then uh, there's an opportunity to specialize in a variety of areas. So I came out of the injury side as a clinician and was really dedicated to figuring out how to reduce the incidence of injuries that were work-related. But I'll never forget the first time I met with, uh, with a fellow that became my, my mentor, my PhD mentor. You know, and I said, I was so excited about this injury prevention. He said, that's the lowest form of ergonomics. And the truth is, because if you design the optimal interface, you get all of the other pluses. And so I, I absolutely understand what he meant and I believe it is the truth. So to that end, I'm gonna take it another degree forward and say that ergonomics is about wellness. And uh, I think that's wonderful that today we've got a heightened interest in, in wellness because uh, this last year we've actually had a, a great uh, increase in the amount of psychological stress, mental stress. And so we're actually opening up this definition of wellness and in embracing all the aspects of human activity, which is exact, or human existence, I should say, not even just activity. Because wellness, if you ask wellness, sometimes people would say, well, it's really the absence of disease, right? They'd be, well, well, that's really not, that's a very small uh, uh, truncated definition because wellness is about optimization of the different domains we exist in. And I love this photo since I've taught wellness. 
uh, and it came from one of the publishers. And so it shows that these are the five core domains that people are in, right? Intellectual, you're here today to expand and grow and support the intellectual domain. But you're also interested in some social wellness, emotional wellness, environmental wellness, spiritual wellness. So uh, as we think it's not just the physical wellness, right? And so it's the balance of all these domains of existence that really determines wellness because you can be the picture of health from a physical standpoint and be a complete wreck, right? For a variety of reasons, whether it's personal and or professional. So it's really the harmony that we can achieve between these different domains of existence. So in ergonomics in particular, we, uh, as it relates to office ergonomics, we tend to look for things like postures, forces, reach, uh, repetition, stress levels, environmental conditions. Those are the more common things that we tend to think about. But those are really about the, the uh, at least uh, most of them there are about the physical interaction. Stress can come from a variety of things, right? They could be physical or, the, or not, but they could be psychological in their entirety. So core ergonomic principles, I'm gonna sip, is based on three, the whole, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just jump right out there and say the whole profession is really has these underpinning core concepts and human variability is, is, is right up there on top. So we, on is, so we go right here at this group, we can say, okay, there's at least some men and some women. So that's two characteristics that differ. But I would ask if we were in a classroom, I would say, well, how, on how many parameters do we vary? Or do humans vary? And you would start, well, the height, age, uh, you know, strength, and you could go through, start compiling a pretty big list. And the truth is, it's, it's easy to compile a list of about a million different ways. And if you consider uh, the gene or genetic variability, um, there's about 25,000 genes that were put together about eh, two, three different million polymorphs or ways and sequences. So there's a huge amount of variability uh, uh, between us. And so in, and if you stop and think about it, it you, for instance, your fingerprint, right, is unique. It is unique. And so is your biochemistry. And uh, it's interesting, normal anatomy is, uh, is actually plus or minus 30% of location size and, and design and so forth. So while we're very similar, we have, we're all unique. And so, so consequently, ergonomics often comes down to the individual preferences, capacities, and limitations. And so while we have general sets of recommendations, and as, as we go through this, I hope you'll pick that up is that really it's about you being comfortable, loving your work and be able to awesomely uh, be the most productive, uh, efficient person you could possibly be. That's what ergonomics is about. The next one, the next concept there is homeostasis. And I like to ask people, what's that? You know, it sounds like a big word, you know, and eventually comes out as kind of that equilibrium and that status quo. We know that humans tend to perturb the organism, right? So we, we somehow, for some reason, we don't like things that are status quo. We always got to push a little bit and we got to kind of push that. And, 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 and then we sort of come back to some normality. And so, uh, you know, well, what I like is, is that anybody know who that guy is down there? He's got the t-shirt, he's the runner, and, and he's got Bolt written on that, you know? And people say, oh, that's Hussein Bolt. And I say, well, who's he? Well, he is the fastest man in the world. So, whoa, well, you know, uh, and I would say, well, can he run that? Uh, can he run his speed that he does a 100 yard dash for a 26 mile? Can he make him the marathoner or the fastest marathoner? Well, no, well, why not? Well, because, you can perturb that organism, the person, but you have to allow recovery before you do it again. So he can run a hundred yards really fast at eight seconds or close to it. And then he has to rest a bit and then he can probably run it again, but he's got to recover. So this concept of recovery and homeostasis is absolutely critical to health. So with the, the underpinnings of our health, we talk about exercise, diet, and sleep. Sleep is a way in which we reboot our brain and we recover biochemically on a daily basis, right? It's a cycle. And then the last concept is so important and it's the systems approach. So if you think about, unless you live on an island by yourself, you are part of a work system, right? So you have input, throughput, and output. And so, oh, and, and then I like to ask, well, what is that all saying about uh, the system where the chain is only as strong as the 
weakest link, right? So sometimes it's, you've got to look upstream in the system to figure out how you can optimize your performance, right? So the problem may be either before you or after you as it relates to output. So, so a knowledge of that system, and, and again, so it's the individual gets optimized, but so does the system has to be looked at and the system has to be optimized in order to get the maximum efficiency, productivity and quality out of that system and out of the people that make up that system. So now you know all about ergonomics, okay? So the office work postures, you know, and of course this last year has really changed things. Uh, Yes, yes, we and we'll talk more about that. But you know, over just the last, I'm going to say the last 30 years, we've had significant leaps forward in workspace design. And so you see workers that have all kinds of uh, everything from the treadmill to to I uh, like this new more like space like one. This fellow in the lower center is sitting here, but. Uh, more standing. Uh, actually, I, I had an opportunity to, 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 to be part of a group that, that, that talked uh, or, or presented to HR, about 500 HR people in Denver at their annual wellness conference or work culture. And, and, and so at that time they were gathering data and say, if you switch to a workstation, you're, you get, you're, you get a better blood profile, your sugars go down, your HDLs go up. On average, they lose, people lose between eight and 12 pounds just by shifting from a sitting to a standing position. And now the conclusion is really, if you can vary the posture and activity, that's really the key. But it, you know, so you split that time up a bit. So the pandemic, the pandemic has dramatically impacted work. And so it's driven many people to uh, be isolated at home. And, and that has been a whole host of, of challenges, everything from the physical uh, uh, workspace, because you're suddenly making your bedroom or the kitchen or, or, the, or somewhere, the living room somewhere that has to be where you work as well as where you carry on home activities. So, so you know, it has brought a whole new set of challenges, which many of you may be uh, spending or may have spent most of your time at home or still are. And at some point will be, be doing more at home and less at in the office or at work as you have in the past. So again, some people have had the opportunity that to uh, design uh, uh, or purchase uh, desks and so forth, and other people are just trying to use the space that they have. So uh, and, and then be creative. You know, it's interesting is that uh, you know, as an ergonomist, trust me, I learn when I go to a work place and observe, and they're intended to evaluate and help them improve their system. I look what people do, and, and it's funny because duct tape and boxes and books and so forth, people do all kinds of modifications to the workspace to improve their comfort. And if you improve your comfort, then you improve your productivity, your accuracy, your quality, all those other factors. So, so here's somebody who is, is at the kitchen table. And so they're using the laptop, uh, but she's got a keyboard down there and a mouse. And, uh, and so she's got that up. It's maybe a little bit low, but the position is better. But she modified to put her on a box. The same thing. She said, gosh, based on this chair height, I need my feet elevated to be comfortable. So she's got some books under there. And these are the kind of modifications that cue somebody up that, gosh, we need to make some changes uh, to the equipment. So this in, in, in contrast to a fundamental uh, accommodation of all that human variability is adjustability, right? So if a workspace and workstation is fully adjustable, then, then it doesn't matter what size you are, we can optimize your fit to that and make it comfortable. But it, classically, here we are, this is a kitchen table, right? So those are fixed solid legs, a fixed solid surface, fixed chairs, height. And so she has to modify uh, uh, herself uh, with some books under the feet. But good thinking, see, she's a junior ergonomist. So, you know, the goal of the ergonomist is actually to work themselves out of a job and that is to make everybody else an ergonomist. So that's what you're, what I'm doing today is hopefully you're gonna come away going, gosh, I know more about ergonomics, I can do stuff. You know, I can make my, my workstation better. So this is a picture of me in my last office and my, my current office is actually pretty similar, but it's even more awesome. And uh, I have, a, work, I have a, a work stand station, so I adjust up and down, but adjustability, adjustability, underscore glaring, that's what's important is because 
everybody has di different ideas and concepts about what is really comfortable for them. Again, we, we recognize there are certain measurement uh, parameters that we recognize fit most populations that so we can look those up and those are in standards. But in truth, you want to be able to adjust things so they're just right for you. Another caveat here is user preference. So uh, once again, as an expert, so I, I have actually six college degrees, I have two doctorates, I'm working on a third. And, and so if I walk into a place and I say, listen, you know, I know what's going on. I got all the credentials. I want you to do this and this. And you got to use this. They're going to go, you know what, buddy, you can stuff it, right? So I love this, the way it's set up. So user preference trumps. So what you can do is help educate people to make better decisions. You can ask them to try things, but you never go tell them, this is what you have to do. We're, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. No, you're going to say, hey, listen, I got some ideas. This might help you. And that's how you approach it. Again, comfort. Comfort is an individual concept, right? So whether we're talking about office temperature, oh, what do you like? Oh, I like about 72. Oh, I like about 76. Oh, I like about 68. So comfort is an individual perception and concept. And so you need to, to recognize that, particularly when you're working with people, you, every, each one of you know what is comfortable and what is uncomfortable, right? So that means that you're in the, in the best decision or the best place to make that decision about what would improve that, that interface. Ease of use. Again, humans are genetically are wired to be lazy, right? So we are, we are wired for energy conservation. So that means what, what you need to do is have ease of use. So if something's easy to do, then it takes less energy and you like it. Where if it's harder to do, you have to, you again, perturb that organism, you have to have recovery. So again, motivation, your knowledge workers. This is very cool. Out of a book by Daniel Pink called A Whole New Mind. He, and he's just a terrific guy. He writes, you can search him. He does TED Talks and stuff. Great guy, but he talks about what it takes to motivate knowledge workers. And he said, purpose. In other words, you work with an organization that you, you align purpose. You say, this is good. My job is worthy and I like this. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in alignment with their mission, vision, values, goals, and so forth. So that's important. Number two is mastery. People like to be good at stuff. Nobody likes to be lousy at stuff because that just, you don't turn out on time. Your productivity is low. You got lots of errors. People, the boss is all over you, right? People like being good at stuff. So what you want to do is whatever you can to support that mastery. People want to be good at stuff. And the last one is interesting is autonomy. Autonomy, people like, people are creative and like to be creative. And so Fortune 500 companies, they've, learned, they've got this message. They give people time to work on their own ideas, develop their ideas that can benefit that company. And so they find they're more creative and more productive when they're not scheduled for 25 hours a day, right? But there's actually some breathing room in there and some creative room in there. So key concepts, very important stuff. Another one, again, the happiness advantage I like this. So if we are happy about what we're doing, how about this? Happy people are 70% more productive, 70% less turnover. They stay put at their jobs, 78% safer. I like that as a safety guy. And they improve the bottom line by 44%. That's pretty cool. That's a reason to develop a workspace that you like to go to and you like to be in with people you like, right? And resonate with. So again, wellness and life success here. Happy people enjoy better lives, work experiences, overall health, expanded social networks, interactions, just lots of good stuff. And so I didn't just make that up. So I actually put, uh, and I sent it to Tricia. This is an article that's actually, it's a little bit dated now, but um, it's from 2005. And, and so the psychologists actually reviewed all of the current research on positive psychology to see because so much is always on the negative and mental health issues and stresses and strains and so it, there are many good things that we can do to improve our our mental state and and happiness so if you also i said that to trish and if you're interested in reading that article it's a great article you'll pull out of it and you realize boy if i can shift my attitude and be happy i'll be i'll just enjoy a better life so that's kind of cool stuff so the happiness advantage is uh, Jean Acor is, and I recommend, I highly recommend his, um, 
uh, his TED talk, Sean Acor, and you've got that A C H O R, terrific. And I ran out and bought his book, and I love it. And he talks about things what what makes us happy. Well, if if things are pleasurable, we're engaged, and we have purpose and meaning. So these they, these three factors are the most predictive of us being happy. So it sounds a little bit like Daniel Pink here, pleasurable, things we like to do, love, have, enjoy, right? And that includes the places, the equipment, the people we're with and everything else. Things that you find pleasurable is good. Engagement, people were, were social creatures, right? So we want to be connected. And we've seen that in a massive way here since the internet uh, happened in this past year. People have created all kinds of interesting ways to connect uh, via Zoom and other kinds of uh, electronic media. And then purpose and meaning. Again, people want to align with organizations, what they work with and what they do, right? On a personal level of their values, their values are the utmost important to them. And so if you are with an organization or other people that you have alignment with, that's good, you enjoy that. So the happiness advantage, good stuff. So office risk factors. So once again, so we talk about repetitive motions. And when we're talking about keyboarding people, those, those people keyboard at rates of 18,000 hits per hour. I mean, enormous amounts of hand motions and movements, fixed and working postures, depending on the deadline. You stay seated at that desk and you may work 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Uh, and not take enough breaks because you're trying to meet some deadlines. So fix the working postures. We're not made. We are not static creatures. We are dynamic. We are made to move. So, so uh, fixed postures. You're not so good. Excessive forces. Uh, you know, in in this case, in office, uh, the the heaviest thing I've seen, or more force, would be like uh, getting a box of copy paper or something. But forces, whether they're uh, sustained or they're re repetitious or they're excessive, can all cause problems. And psychological stress. Again, we all we all. Uh, if you say, well, I will say, live in our own heads, is that we respond to the stresses around us in different ways and find different things stressful. Um, and so, again, static loading means we're still and we're not moving. So that's that fixed posture. So you actually have muscles working, but you're not moving much. So it starves the blood supply and therefore it causes you to feel burning, pain, fatigue, headaches, things in your upper back or your low back because you're not moving around. That's why you take that break and go for a walk and stretch and move and that's better. But you put all that stuff together and that's what causes musculoskeletal disorders or cumulative trauma or repetitive motion injuries. So there's lots of different names for those kinds of things. And so it's interesting. So computer users actually, the, the most common complaint are, are is eye strain. And I, and, I, and I remember when I was doing my PhD, what drove me home every day was my eyes would just simply get too tired, would be fatigued. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting is that when we read paper, we blink more. And when we read a screen, we blink less. And so our eyes tend to dry. And they think that's part of the eye fatigue related to computer use. Uh, headaches, headaches, about 92% of headaches actually are a result of tension in our neck and shoulders. Carpal tunnel syndrome, that's a big one you hear about. It's a very expensive, causes a lot of disability. It leads to surgery in many cases. And it's just a bad situation. A tendonitis is actually uh, precedes that, and it's just inflammation of the biotendon structure that moves all the body parts that went away. We do our work, and then simple back and neck tension or strain, right? Strain is overuse, and that can be sustained with a little bit of movement or excessive forces uh, or movement can also strains are different types. So ergonomic assessment, the idea of going in and taking a look is to improve, right? We want to figure out how to make you more comfortable, right? We want to de because if you're more comfortable again, then we'll get more out of you. I mean, honestly, that's why ergonomics works. And that's why all the Fortune 500 companies have ergonomists is because they know if they create a good situation that you'll produce for them. You don't get tired, you'll work that 12 hour shift or you'll go to that 14 hour deadline uh, to meet some kind of deadline. Uh, but increasing job satisfaction, right? So if you have a good interface that optimizes who you are, what you are, what you're capable of, you know, you're satisfied. It's interesting, is that uh, a, 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 a single question is, are you satisfied with work, with where you work? is an indicator of the likelihood of a workplace illness or injury. 
if because unpe unhappy people get hurt, unhappy people develop problems. And so job satisfaction is actually gigantic. Extended work life. So I retired once. I don't like retirement. It's way overrated. And so I'm going to keep working until they tell me, you know, tell Trish and other people saying, listen, Dave, you ought to retire, you know. So again, and, and then maybe I'll do it. But but I think we ought to be able to do what we want for as long as we want, right? And certainly from, a, from an economic standpoint, if you're working for somebody or yourself, right, increased productivity is what you want. Quality, what you want to be able to be competitive. So again, if you can reduce, eliminate, or manage risk factors, then you're simply going to be in better shape. And that's what ergonomics is about. So over, over to the right, there is that little evaluation form. And that's a, a very simple one that I've uh, posture-based uh, developed. And so you're welcome to use it and Trish can send it out. And, it is, and we'll sort of go through things a little bit here to the chair. So again, the chair is the most frequently used piece of box equipment. And I'll bet you, I'll bet most of you never thought that. You're thinking computer, you're thinking calculator, you're thinking phone, but the chair, think about it. What's the purpose of the chair? It's to support your thighs, buttocks, back, right? And if it's not good, you are not happy, right? Or you gonna leave, you're simply not gonna stay because it kills you, right? So, so what you have to have is a chair that is because of human variability, it's adjustable. Right. And the idea of comfortable, well, there's many types of chairs with different, different materials, different designs. And so you have to find what's comfortable. And starting with a good chair is, is a good start. So uh, well, in the past, we had a good relationship with HP back in, in Colorado, and they actually had a chair fitting room. And so I would take my students out there every semester, and, and they had a local ergonomist, a guy who was on, on site. And when they get a new employee, they take them into this room and there's like 25 different chairs. Well, let's see what feels good. And then you, you, you fit them to that and you find what they really like. Okay, take and try that for a couple of weeks, right? And, and, and if it's not so good, come on back, we'll find another one. And so what you want to do, the chair is so important, the seat pan, the seat pan is what you actually sit on. And so people come in different sizes. So chairs vary from 15 inches out to 22 inches now. And the depth can be at 15 to 20 inches or so. Typically, it would be a pretty deep pan. But so you get, you get a chair that fits you, that you fit into, that is comfortable and supports you. Again, support, so you want to do thigh, uh, you know, buttocks and thighs is important. You don't want it, the seat pan too long so that you create compression behind the knee and then decrease the blood flow to the lower extremity. And that could lead to a problem, of a, a more serious problem. And then the backrest, the backrest is important. I uh, use a stool because I want to force myself to maintain a better posture. So uh, I use a stool and it has a little bit of a low back support, but back supports will range from the full length of the back to typically if there is then the small one would be about 10 inches and somewhere in between, but how it's placed and whether it really offers support is what's critical. And then the five, uh, a five post base or is, is simply for stability, stability and safety. So I still I go, I have gone into businesses that have the old four poster ones that actually flip over. And so that's a problem. So the chair, where way important. So a very simple concept here. If you get this today, you could actually, uh, you could apply it and immediately help somebody else. That's a little tougher for you because you don't see yourself. But if you have put mirrors around, because neutral posture means that you have a load moment of zero. You have less stress on any body part when you're in neutral posture. So if you think about how could I get myself uh, uh, to a neutral posture. Well, if you stand, that's a is a is a picture of somebody in a what's called a normal anatomical position, and so everything is relaxed and you're standing balanced and there's equal muscle tension. It's minimal in order to maintain that uh, position in time and space. And the seated position changes a bit because we suddenly have the thighs go perpendicular to the torso. But again, it's straight up and down. It's a 90 degree. And then the same thing with the arms are relaxed at the side and the forearm is flexed to 90 degrees. And so these are the two neutral postures for sitting and standing. So again, it's where your body parts are, hands, wrists, forearms, head, shoulders, all the way down to your feet and how well they're supported, right? 
keyboards, lots of people. There's all kinds of opportunities out there. So um, it, the, uh, on the top one are just, you know, again, the traditional design of sorts. But what's, what, what's important is the position. You see the first one is, is they've got a neutral, meaning that if you draw that line down through the hand, it looks as though it's relatively straight versus the one next to it says awkward. And so that is ulnar or radi radial deviation is what that's called. So for instance, laptops or narrow skinny keyboards, if you put it in your lap, then you tend to do this, this uh, ulnar deviation and you feel, that, uh, you feel the discomfort in that if you do it for very long. And then the next one down where you say, okay, how about the, the angle of that? So, so again, what you want is your hand is relatively flat. So if you move into extension or flexion, then that you're moving away from that and creating stress. So most keyboards are actually a little bit upward tilt. And the concept was to decrease the reach to the keys is how they're designed. But, but you people adjust that from, from a neutral flat. They might have a decline or an incline. Uh, but again, that ends up being user preference. What you don't want to do is, is move your wrist and hand to too much uh, either flexion or extension and the same thing with the mouse uh, the mouse over here is actually that's the real culprit related to carpal tunnel syndrome because it's the pressure it's the contact pressure and many of us keep our hand on that mouse for long periods of time as we do the different uh, variety of, of things on our computers and uh, and there are many different types of uh, mice so, but again, it's the neutral positioning that is the best and, and a, a little light touch would be good. And I just put this down below here. So this guy, Russ Hit, uh, just in, and you could find him on LinkedIn if you want to, but he works with a company that, a Kinesis, that produces a variety of different keyboards. And if you want to explore and look at uh, ergonomic keyboards, uh, you can do that. And there's a source you could go to, seems like a really nice fellow. I'm not endorsing that, I'm just saying it's an option. But I've looked at all kinds of keyboards over my career. I've been able to evaluate them for different different companies. But this is a split keyboard you see down below. So again, it's greater accommodation to the individual comfort and neutral positioning. So uh, again, I, it's interesting. My own personal experience has been, uh, I've tried several different ergonomic keyboards and I actually go back to my original. I seem to, that's what I grew up on. I guess it's my habit. Uh, I like it. And so that's where I stick to Workstation organization. The idea in ergonomics is, is that there should be some kind of system thinking in terms of prioritization as you design your workstation layout. It may be the, 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 the frequency, it may be the distance or the reach that you go and the frequency in which you reach things or the importance of things. So, I mean, if you're the person who has the magic button and it has to be there uh, real close and you don't want to put it somewhere far away, you want it right where it is or if you're on the phone all day or, or well, whatever it may be, but also movements that are easy. So we call this a workspace envelope is what you see is the in the yellow, the green, and then that kind of, uh, uh, I guess it's a lighter yellow, but so the usual activity is 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 where your major work is done and then occasionally gets a little further out and then and then pretty soon you're out where you not normally and i see people who've designed uh workstations where they're actually reaching uh, up on shelves grabbing heavy books that could actually result in a, in a shoulder injury for instance so so have some some good uh methodology or system to what you're doing based on some of these principles of reach frequency importance movement and ease of use right so it's easy it's easy to do it's less energy it's less fatiguing and you're likely to make less errors and be more productive again clutter clutter can be a problem i've kind of fought it my entire life um some of us are are, are natural clutter pile and pile makers and so uh, it, that degrades our productivity because we have to be looking for things. So if you can try to, uh, you know, eliminate clutter is good. And if you if you uh, type from documents and you view view documents while you're online, use a document holder and have that up next to your screen, so you're not looking down uh, at it and twisting your neck and looking into flexion. You're just going to create fatigue. So let's take a look here. It's a workstation interface. So this is a seated worker, like most of you, I'm guessing, um, although some of you may be doing some standing too. So what you want is to have just that neutral positioning relative to those interfaces. So you've got a terminal that you're gonna look at. So 
Yeah, this is actually some ergonomic clip art, but it's a little bit low. So typically the top of that terminal is, is or that screen is about eye height because normally we, we actually the normal gaze is about 30 degrees down. So if, and if you raise it higher, you'll, you'll pick your head up. And if you have different, unfortunately, uh, like bifocals and things, you move into extension, that'll cause neck pain and fatigue for sure and lead to headaches and so forth. The keyboard, the keyboard, the arms are, are relaxed at the side and the forearm is flexed to 90 degrees. And that, that woman is right there able to just hover over the top of that keyboard. And hovering is much better than using a uh, wrist rest. So in testing, uh, we know that people push down on that wrist rest with approximately three to eight pounds of pressure. And so all it takes is one pound of pressure on tissue to impair circulation. So wrist rest is a rule. I, I don't advocate it or people say, well, I love it. I use it. I want to do it. Well, then I'd say get the gel filled one at least or get one that's wider because if you can distribute the force over a wider area, then it's less compressive to any specific tissues. So that's kind of a good thing. And the mouse, the mouse should be right next to that keyboard on a platform so that your arm still is at your side, relaxed in your forearm. It shouldn't be up on the desk where you're reaching out for it. Definitely don't want to do that. So a mouse platform in the environment. Again, everybody's idea of comfort needs to be adjusted accordingly, whether it's these things at home, noise with kids uh, also out of school. Uh, boy, it's been a challenge for many workers at home in noisy environments and uh, the no extra noise of a full house full of people. Uh, but you know, lighting, air conditioning, temperature, all those things are important to and you adjust them, adjust them to your preference, right? To your preference. Okay, so, so it's a city workstation, now a standing workstation. And again, you can design uh, something at home that could be, uh, I hate to say, but on the kitchen counter, for instance, where you may have some variation, but, or, or, or uh, you know, you can buy a production one that adjusts or, or you can uh, buy something that looks similar and that adapted. But again, it's the same challenges, right? So you want that terminal about eye height at the top because you're gonna gaze down. You want to have that keyboard positioned so that your arms, are, uh, your arms are relaxed at your side and your forearms are flexed about 90 degrees and you can hover over that keyboard and you can reach that mouse. And again, your conditions. So all we're doing is changing from a sitting to a standing or attempting uh, again to as main, maintain as much neutral position as possible uh, because we know that that minimizes energy consumption, minimizes muscle contraction, minimizes fatigue. Uh, that, that comes from uh, the opposite of that. So let's take a look at a couple of stations. So this is a big guy right here and he's, he's sitting here and you can see he's got, a, he actually has an interesting one here. Um, uh, uh, he's got a, 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 a uh, terminal that moves up and down. It's got a workstation. This is called an Ergotron workstation. And so this is kind of a low tech modification to a very old desk. He's got an old desk that looks like it was made back in the fifties. He's got a gigantic chair, so he's a big guy who likes to have this full uh, length uh, uh, chair back that goes almost the top of his head. But we can take a look and see how his arms, he's got arm rests, for instance. Okay, those are something I don't like, so I take them out. I've always removed them from the chair. They come with your, uh, and they should be adjustable. They should have some padding on them. You can see he's actually got some wear in, in that. but. It should have some padding because again, contact stress is a real problem. If it pushes on tissue, uh, then it cre can create a problem. So, but we can take a look at that and say, okay, he doesn't look too bad there. Uh, it looks like his seat is actually probably too low to the ground. His, because right, his thigh should be at right angles and then he should go straight down to the ground and then his feet should be supported, but they're flexed backwards. Again, when he stands up in here, he's about 6'5". He was a big guy. And so here he's adjusted his Ergotron workstation. He's brought that up. And you can see the top of that is about eye height. So that's actually pretty good. But his arms are not relaxed at his side, right? He's actually reaching forward. So if we put, let me go jump over here. If we put uh, a, a sensor up here in these muscles, called an electromyography or an EMG sensor, then as he moves his arm forward, you would hear this would, this only can occur through activation of musculature. 
So he's got to support the weight of his arm in time and space. And that's why you want to relax because then you're not exerting energy to support that body part in time and space. And if we look down here, you can look at this, the angle of this, here's his forearm coming out. Well, his hand is not neutral, but it's extended. He's lifted it upward because he wants to use this wrist rest and he's got a gel filled wrist rest and he's reaching out there. So I would, I would have some concern about if he does this for very long, he could end up with some problems. So it'd be better to kind of go in and help him uh, make some, uh, consider some of uh, some little adjustments or adaptations to make that a more comfortable experience. So here's another fellow. So in contrast, uh, you know, he's very relaxed. So that chair, uh, the, the previous one he was sitting against, that was solid. He's got a modification with his neck support, but it's, it's, it's a, like a three quarter back. But this, he's sort of sitting in this seat pen kind of weirdly. Uh, and I tell you, I've seen lots of people sitting in a variety of positions. And if that's what they like to do and move around, then, you know, that's what they'll do. But, but if they do that too long, they're likely to, uh, to uh, suffer for it. So let's go just take one, another angle over here. So I would ask, is that chair offering support to his buttocks, thighs, and back? And I would say that his back is getting zero support. Right. In fact, he's got a large, he's, he's got a rounded back. If I drop a plumb line, remember, is that new, neutral positioning should be the ear, should be over the shoulder, should be over the hip. Right. And then if he's standing over the knee and over the ankle. But so that means that his muscles, these muscles up here have to support his weight. His head, his weight, the head weighs about 10 pounds in time and space it's forward to his shoulder his shoulder is forward and i don't know if he's he's leaning on his uh his thigh here or not but his whole back is activated to support this slouched posture or uh, if he's relaxed he's resting on his ligaments which will, which is not a good that's not not good at all but over here he does have a little platform next to his keyboard but he also has what looks like a hard edge so you don't want tissue pushing on hard edges, especially on a desk edge, because one pound per square inch impairs circulation. And if you're asking a muscle to work and then you're taking away the, the sugars and the oxygen that it needs to actually, the fuel that it needs to function, you're, you're self-defeating is what you're doing. So how about this lady? So go ahead, she's, she's, uh, she's standing, she's got the same kind of ergotron adjustability. And, and so again, I, I wish if we were in a, in a classroom together, you, you, you already, I, I know you would already start to tell me what I see here. Well, first thing I see is that this terminal is, is about, um, it's kind of nose height. So, so the terminal is a little lower than it should be. As a consequence, she's got this low. So again, her arm, her, her head is not in line over her shoulder, which is, which yeah, I would say her shoulder looks like it's a line over hip, but her arm is slightly flexed forward, but she's reaching downward that it's not at a right angle. And so that causes her risk, her wrist. This is the opposite of ulnar deviation. This is called radial deviation. So she's crimping her hand backwards or upward. And so that can create a problem here. And she has a vertical mouse. So she has a different style of mouse uh, rather than one that's flat and horizontal. It's actually vertical. And I've looked at a variety of, of mice, and I would say that there is no perfect, it's again, the individual, but also an overuse syndrome of any type can result. Again, so over here, uh, we can take a look at her hands or keyboard, but we can see that uh, we look down here, what we would like is to have this hand lined up with this, but she's actually kind of putting these inward right here, right toward radial deviation instead of ulnar deviation, which is outward. So, and it's extended a bit. So if she does this for a long time, this might actually create problems. So we could see there could be some room for improvement. There's that mouse again. So she actually looks like she rests. Uh, this is called the thenar eminence on this. And so that's actually a pretty good, to a good area uh, to rest distribute force on, but this is a hard surface too. So it's probably not the, the optimal. And again, the positioning of this is low because her arm should be at a right angle. 
and here's some, this is, you know, when, when at my prior university, this is where I took this picture. This fellow was a visiting scholar. And so I love it when somebody is temporary. They're like, okay, here, here's a desk. Here's a computer. This is your place. And he was going to be there for three months. So this, this is what they gave him. And this is what he was willing to work with. And so you can see he's he's got a chair that is probably too low. He's got his legs stretched out. Uh, we don't know unless we have him sit straight, but he's he's not getting optimal support here, but it's a three quarter back. He's leaning, his posture is not real good. He's got his ear forward to his shoulder, which means the muscles in his upper body or back and neck have to support that in time and space. This is a hard edge right here. And this is he, so desks are actually designed to write on. They're not designed for keyboards. So a keyboard tray should be added to that. And they're typically, the keyboard tray is a little bit below this. So what you want is this down and then a right angle is what you like. Over here, we've got a fellow who's got a little vision problem. So uh, typically we see, we were the recommendation, actually look at this, the top of this is, uh, it's, it's probably a little bit low over here. The distance from the eye of the terminal on average is about 24 inches plus or minus. I've seen people 18 inches up to 40 inches. So again, it depends if you've got corrected uh, lenses, uh, that, that can be a challenge. Uh, or, or certain visual limitations, but so he's leaning forward. This chair is not supporting his back. Um, and so you can just see people, you know, this this has got a cutout in it. And so the position of this doesn't look too bad over here. Although he's got his, he's got a body part, his hand and wrist is up against that hard edge. So pearls here, let's say organizational priorities, right? So wherever you work, I guarantee that these are priorities and then you, and, and, and this ought to be a priority, uh, but they all go together. And I say, don't decouple them. Don't decouple them. What you want to do is optimize that, that interface so that you achieve all these. Uh, again, user preference trumps, adjustability accommodates. So what you want is adjustability so that you can make it comfortable for you. Um, comfort is individual perception, right? Uh, trial and error is inevitable, particularly as it relates to individuals, right? So you could have a, a set of guidelines uh, or even standards, but really when it comes down to fine tuning, it's an individual. So worker, worker satisfaction too may be complex and for lots of reasons. So that has to be uh, dealt with. Uh, teach people to be their own ergonomist, right? That's why I said, I'm hoping today you could go and apply some of these things, these skills and the, I say, these concepts. Again, if you're gonna buy, if you're in charge of purchasing, make sure you get adjustable equipment, right? Because you know, people vary in size very size. Again, what you want to do too, I remember one of my first uh, uh, ergonomic consultations was at, was at an office. I went in and it was a very small woman who, who couldn't reach the ground and had her foot hooked under the post of the chair to stay at the desk, right? Nobody had showed her actually how to adjust the, 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 the furniture or anything else. So you want to empower people to optimize their workspace, right? So you can provide the ergonomic consultation, but, but you wanna empower them. Again, it doesn't mean you have to go out and buy new stuff. So I've seen all kinds of low tech, low cost interventions that really optimized an interface for a worker. So try that first before you say, okay, let's go out and spend a thousand bucks for a new uh, sit stand desk or, or, or $4,000 for this fabulous chair. Well, you don't need to do that. You can get a good chair for 750, but 500, to maybe 750 would be a fairly decent one, but, but they go up, they really go up depending on what you got there. Again, when you frame, if, if any of you are going to frame your needs um, uh, for ergonomic uh, equipment or modifications, either in your workspace at work or at home, frame that in the, the context of your company or unit priorities, because that's how you get it. That's how you get cooperation. Again, remember new is not always better. In fact, I like when uh, furniture gets recycled from person to person and you find it and finally get it matched to the right person. Again, remember stuff is not ergonomic. Right, so you see, it's 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 a big uh, marketing ploy, but stuff has ergonomic features, and so what is is based upon those principles that we talked about: human variability, right? Systems approach, homeostasis. So take home messages as we wind down the hour here. Uh, again, 
pay attention to your how you've got your workstation designed. Remember, adjust your chair first to maximize your support and then adjust your workstation to fit you. That's how optimal ergonomics is achieved. Oh your my age. God. Do I? Did somebody say something? Oh. We're good. I got it muted. Oh, okay. Um, arrange. Uh, well, if somebody had a question, I would welcome it. So again, arrange your workstation to maximize your efficiency energy. Uh, because again, what you want to do is feel good about what you're doing and literally stay healthy. Okay. So with that, I wound down here and uh, I, I think I've got some contact information for you, but how about any questions either in the chat box or turn on, turn yep. on your uh, volume and, and, and let's, let's have some exchange or interaction. We had one from the chat um, earlier is from Carol is how important is it that your elbows are supported by standing? I'm sorry, your elbows aren't supported by are oh. supported while standing. Oh, no, they're not. Actually, I never use el I never use elbow supports. I take them off chairs, even if they're there. I mean, you know, you don't. What you should do is have your arm relaxed at your side and flex your forearm. So if it's at a 90 degree angle, then that is neutral or you could go plus or minus a little bit, whatever's most comfortable. But, but no, you normally do not put anything under your elbow. If you do, that's called contact stress. So there are people who like working typically if they're seated and if they have elbow supports on their chair. What that is typically for is actually, if I'm an executive, I'm sitting in my office and you're gonna come in and talk to me. Or Trish is gonna come and ask me for a raise. I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna relax in a nice big chair and say, yeah, what's up? You know, But it's not for the worker. It's not while you work. All right. Um, next, we have Marisa. Marissa, I might have killed your name. I'm sorry if I did. That's, that's fine. Um, yeah, I was curious about the sort of elbow position because it seemed difficult, especially if you don't have an elbow rest that, you know, your wrists are either always going to be hitting something and then your arms go up or, you know, from the elbow to the fingertip is going to be going down. I don't no, I don't really understand how you would get that in a resting position where your wrist isn't touching anything without having to use active force all the time. Well, if you float over, uh, if you float over the keyboard, I mean, people are contacting, like this guy's standing, his contact is right here at the wrist. Uh, and that's not good. So the, the, again, the optimal situation is here, let me get my standing one, is this, there is no elbow support and this person, this woman is floating over the top. That's how you should work. You so think? is the relaxation in the shoulder? Cause you'll have to exert force to keep that elbow position, right? No. It doesn't relaxed. seem natural to me, I don't know. Less, I, I tell you less. I mean, uh, so it is contraction of musculature that stabilizes the body position. So I will tell you that the further we go from neutral, the more muscle activation occurs. So if you can be closest to neutral positioning, then you use less energy and less muscle force. So as it relates to contact, again, if, if, you, if you're a person who's seated and you like elbow supports and you find them, actually, it's interesting, there are the, under the, in the expensive chair version of this, there are, are, are actuated arms. These actually are made to move with you. So I didn't, I didn't have any pictures of that, but if you go out online, you can find some very fantastic chairs that will support that it will actually fit under the whole forearm, if you will, to support that, but, but it also moves with you. So it's actuated. And so those are high end items, but typically, uh, again, it's, uh, you know, at the most wrist rest, but I, I don't think elbow supports, you know, if you, if you prefer it, that's good, but just keep your arms at, if you can relax them onto that elbow support. And then, and then simply, right, if you have that workspace envelope we're talking about where you're moving within that, if you're tight, you've got your keyboard, your keyboard trays down here, and you're simply moving laterally or in, a, in an arc within that usual workspace envelope, then that's less stressful. Thank awesome. you. We have, we have Thank two. You so much. 
two more in the chat. So one from Nicole in the chat is, how else can I improve my ability to use a mouse comfortably? I'm holding my wrist in neutral position, but get pain no matter which mouse I'm using. Any ideas? Yikes. Yeah, so is the, in, is the, is the pain at the base of the wrist or in this area, the bowler area, or is it, the, can you warm your thumb? Nicole, if you want to unmute and let him know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so the pain is at the top of my hand. Um, it's the top of my hand. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, you know what you might try, and, and it's probably from overusing it. It's again, pressure uh, after years and years of research. Uh, and everybody thought it was the keyboards. They actually believe that the mouse is the major problem for hand-related problems. I would say you might consider, let's go back to this one, this type or style. This is a vertical mouse and there are, there's trackballs. There are a variety of them that you will shift. Your hand will move from this position where you would move it to this position. And then you can roll the trackball or in this case, she can move the fingers like that because this, this area down here is called the thenar eminence, and that has lots of uh, nice muscular tissue compared to the rest of our hand. So if you're going to rest, it's better to rest on this area. You're not going to have the same adverse. Remember, so that carpal tunnel is unique in here. So there are nine different structures, tendons, and nerves that go through this. And unfortunately, that mousing creates pressure and then uh, inflammation and swelling, and then the syndrome develops. And then the way they do that is they go in and they cut that and open it up. You don't want that. So I would say try to change that to a vertical mouse. And, and, and there's a, again, you go to the market, if you go out on the web, you'll find a couple of different versions or more. And you could, I, I would say for whatever they cost, it's worth the effort to try it. Wow, thank you. Um, I, I'm just am wondering if anyone else is adjusting their workstation as we're sitting ah. here. I have, and I feel like I have the least ergonomic. We have one other question uh, from Monica. Is, in your opinion, how much should a person expect to spend on a chair for our home office? Well, again, what I, I have looked at a gazillion chairs, what I like is that if the company, you know, well, like, it'd be nice. It's, that's part of what the change is occurring is, is, is it reasonable to ask your employer to buy one? Because uh, uh, I would say in most cases, what I would, what I say is between 500 and 750 bucks would be is what a, a decent chair would cost. Um, the ones that you get for $79 are probably not, not very good. I mean, one, because you, I would say you need to see that it fits you and then it has adjustability that suits your needs. And so the more adjustability, the more ergonomic features, the, the, the price goes up, but also the materials that they're made of so that they're comfortable. There's good padding, there's a waterfall edge that doesn't create a pressure behind your knee. And then if you like, again, elbow rests, it has them. And if they do, they're adjustable and they're padded. Well, thank you. I will say my chair from, I think, 1985 does not hit that range, but it doesn't have armrests, so I'm good on that. Um, do we have any other questions for Dr. Gilkey? Going once, going twice. Well, thank you. Um, with that, uh, we can go ahead and conclude today's webinar, please. I will put it in the chat one more time if you get a chance um, in the very near future. Please... Uh, as I'm trying to multitask, it's going super terribly. Uh, there we go. The um, evaluation, I have everybody's email addresses that have put it in the chat and I will shoot it out, shoot the information out to you later today. Uh, but on behalf of Incura Region 7 Professional Education Development Committee, thank you for your participation in today's webinar and a special thanks to Dr. Gilkey, our presenter. So- um, Bye everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, if you have any questions, let us know. But otherwise that concludes today's presentation. Thank you. All right, Trish. Bye-bye.